Hi everyone, Messi Cody here with the last part of my interview with Adam Goodrich. Not only an interview, actually a tutorial where he's going to show us how to use Gaia, Gina and CTS. That's right, this time we get to play with CTS and Gina. We're going to create a beautiful world together. This video was taken on my live Twitch stream, all the W's dot twitch dot tv slash the messy coder where you can come and see me every weekend playing about making games talking to game developers and sometimes we give away some juicy free assets and toys to play with so sit back enjoy and i'll see you all in a second So the extension system is completely open and completely customizable. So there are two types of extension you can create for Gaia. And this is, um, uh, this is um, how you go about doing that. So everything, the other, the other thing with Gaia is it's all open and it's all customizable if, if you take the time to learn how to do it. So you can create two types of extensions. One is an art extension where we, we all the spawners and the resources that go with a spawner. So for your trees and your villages and your towns and so on, you can actually drag and drop them onto the uh, extension creator and automatically generate an extension. So in this case, this is one for desktop ground cover package for speed tree. So this is available on the website if you want to download it. And if you've got that package, then Gaia will, with with this um, little extension, you, Gaia will now be able to spawn that stuff into your environment. So if you get settings that you like, you can save them in, as an extension, which is really cool. And uh, let's go back to Gaia briefly, and I'll show you the GX tab, because that's where these extensions live. Um, is it? I'm still at 45, hang on. So uh, go to the guy manager. Here we go. Yep. And, uh, click on GX. So you've got installed extensions and compatible extensions. So anything that um, and I've I've now linked it through to this to this website. Oh, I used, you used to have like I used to be able to see the three D Ford stuff and Sean's stamps and things. Yeah, I needed to change it because people would do extensions more rapidly than I would release updates to Gaia. So um, the interesting thing about these extensions is provided you conform to the little uh, tools that I give you, Gaia will automatically, if they're actually in your scene, Gaia will auto detect them and auto use them. So we'll, uh, the camera and light is one that I that I did as, as, as both a helper and a demonstration for the extension system. We won't click that just yet because um, we're still doing stuff, but um, let's go back to our extension screen, and I'll talk through some of, some of the um, the stuff that's there. So all of these extensions, they base. Actually, let's go to the screen where I talk about how to make them. Was that just further down, or yeah, cool. So the art one, these are, you know, creating up your spawners and all that sort of stuff. But if you scroll further down, so there's how to create an art extension, my step-by-step tutorial. And then there's code-based extensions. So if you're uh, somebody who's got, so, you know, examples are, Tencoco and Simono and Enviro and Fog Volume 3. These are, you know, extensions. They generally take about 10 minutes to build. They're not actually very difficult unless the, the asset itself is a little bit more challenging. So what Gaia does is it passes information about the environment to the extension. And then the extension, when you instantiate whatever that might be, like the weather system, the lighting system, the water system, it uses that information about the environment to then work out where to place that stuff into your scene. And the whole idea of this is just to make it easy for people to do stuff. So um, that's extensions. If we go back up, there's a whole bunch of really um, good assets, quality assets that are um, already integrated into Gaia. And there are some more ones on the way. 
But I guess the point of that is it's really a five to 10 minute job to create one. And, you know, if you're using it in your project and you're not an asset producer, you can still, if you've got a spawner, which has got an interesting setup, drag and drop it onto the expansion manager and forever and a day, that spawner is now just a button click away. So it's a way of saving those configurations, but it's also a way of sharing them. If you create an extension that's, that spawns your custom asset, whatever it might be, and you've got other people on your project and they want to be able to do the same thing, then what the extension generates is just a, um, a C sharp, it's a code file. So you give that file to the other person and provided they've got the same assets in their project, it will just work. <sighs> that took a bunch of time to build too. There's at least a month of work on that. I love, I love leaving you to chat while I'm sitting here having a coughing fit. It's, it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I appreciate it. Just, just let me randomly yeah. rave on while, we're, while you're doing stuff. Let's um, go back to Gaia yeah, just, and I'll show you the... Cool. I've just got a question here about... Um, the question that I always ask any, any asset dev is, like, is there going to be a sale for Adam's assets anytime soon? Now I really want them. Well, we're glad that we're able to share some of the love and promote some of this stuff because, um, especially uh, Gina, it's it's under underappreciated, I think, on the, on the asset store. Yeah, look, Gaia. Most of my assets were in the big mega sale in November and December, and Unity will frown on me if I put other assets in on sale again really quickly. So I'd say it'd probably be at least a couple of months before they'll go on sale. Um, and Unity are changing how um, they do their sales now. I mean, we've seen the end of the daily sale, we've seen the end of the weekly sale, and we had the Black Friday and then the mega sale as like pretty much like the the goodbye to the huge that huge explosion of sales, everyone just spending a load of money. So it's going to be interesting to see what they're going to come up with next. Yeah, and they do have something in mind, and it seems like a really cool idea. So we'll see, see how that pans out. Ooh, so what's what, important? Look at that. CTS is a terrain shader, but it's also a professional, a, a set of professional quality um, textures. So it depends on your perspective. You, you'd probably be quite comfortable to spend the money on CTS just to buy the textures and get a terrain shader chucked in, or you'd be comfortable to spend the money on the train shader and get a bunch of textures chucked in. <laughs> never thought well, of it like that. Yeah, and like when you think about what you pay for it, that's about what you'd pay for each one or the other on the asset store, depending where you look. So um, Bart and I tried to deliver something that we thought was really, really exceptional value for money. So that's actually quite large CTS. It's the, actually the textures that add up all the height because they're all really high quality textures. But once it's imported, actually making it work is very, very quick. Um, a chat can't actually see the, the window that's over my um, Unity that's preventing me to, from doing anything. That beautiful import asset window that locks up Unity. So uh, while we wait for my computer to recover itself, Tech Trader is asking, so how do you market your assets? Good question, bud. Great question. Um, so I, I do a whole bunch of different things. I, um, I work actively with Unity. So Unity actually provide a bunch of my stuff. I try and give as good a value back to them as, as they get from me. I build tech, tech demos for Unity as well. Actually, if you can go to my, uh, I'll show you something that's really cool. Uh, and it's, uh, in showing it, I'm also um, showing some of the cool stuff that you might be interested in, because this is free. So if we scroll up on the website and go into my blog section, uh, community blog. So there's a thing I created called the World Manager API. And if you click into that one, it's the first post. And this is, uh, give it a second to load. This is a tool that I, um, I created. Um, actually, just scroll back up. It looks like you're missing something. 
and just scroll down. Oh no, it's okay. So this is a tool that acts like a middleware tool between your terrain system, your your lighting and, and, and weather system. And you control this thing and it's all done via a very simple interface. And then this drives everything else in your scene. And provided the asset supports it, and most of the major assets do, you know, you can control your weather, you can control your snow, your, you know, all these different aspects, fog, um, via this single API, and this is free, so if anybody is interested in it, go and have a look at it, because just using this in your game will add a lot of value and sort of structure to the way you do your environments. But if you scroll down, um, let's go and show a video of it. Uh, that's the demo. Uh, let's go to the, the how-to. Yeah, click on that. So this is, you know, blah, 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 where I yak and show how to do this thing, but if we scroll forward into the video a bit, so this is all on my website if you want to go and find it. So I've integrated Unity Timeline, so you can use Timeline to control your game time and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I've given it code examples on how to use it for, for the developers out there. And Unity actually were using this as part of their roadshow. So, um, I spent about a week building uh, quite a nice and interesting and, and rich demo for Unity because it shows off timeline and it shows off Cinema Machine and it shows off, you know, the power of Unity when you get the right tools working together in it. So I encourage you to go and have a look at that. So that's one way of marketing, which is I working with Unity. Then I regularly post on the various Unity Facebook forums. I post on Reddit. Uh, I've got a Twitter account and post uh, on Twitter quite often. So um, I use a whole range of different things as part of the marketing thing. I've explored a bit of Facebook marketing, but at the moment I can't tell whether my spend gets me a return on investment. Do you see this being used in animation instead of games? There's some interesting stuff that I'm doing which I can't announce yet, but you know, if you've seen uh, the Book of the Dead or the Adam videos, that sort of might give you a sense of where I'm going with some of these tools. And I see them, I see Unity as being a, a tool that's used more in um, uh, movie and much, much richer development, particularly with tools like um, Timeline and Cinema Machine. So WAPI is a system, or World App Manager API is a system that's free that makes it easy for all these things to work together. It provides a glue. And even then, there's, there's a month of my time sitting in this. It might seem simple, but often simple things aren't actually simple at all until you spend the time to work out how to make them simple. By this stage, uh, maybe CTS is actually imported. Yeah, let's go and have a peek. Oh, hang on. Uh... No, we're still, we're, we're close, we're close to the end. We're close. So somebody asked, can we make world uh, real-time weather with um, the World Manager API? Um, if you bothered to do some sort of, you know, web services integration um, out to a weather service to get that information, then you could pipe it through to World Manager API, and then everything else that's hanging off of that would just work. So if it's raining, then the terrain would be wet and, you know, the clouds will be chucking. If you if that video that we just watched, that's actually um, everything in, is driven via World Manager. Somebody asked if I'm interested in going to UE4. I actually, before I built Gaia, I went to, I explored UE4. And at the time, there was no real documentation on how their terrain system worked. And... By that stage, I already knew Unity quite well. And I just thought, I'd love to support UE as well, but it's going to take me another six months just to learn how that engine works, you know, the deep, deep level of how it works, sort of, and I already have that knowledge for Unity. So I just went, for now, I'm going to go Unity. Where I'm going in the future is to support all the different engines. Um, 
the way I'm engineering all my new technology is that it's not Unity specific, but it's generic. So then I should be able to push renderers out to different um, platforms. Um, I was playing about in the past with Bart's, um, he had that snow shader that he, that he, he released. Um, I can't remember the, the name of it, is it I, snow and ice or something like that. And um, just before you guys came out with CTS. So there was a question about making it, you never accidentally make it snow when your terrain is reflecting summer season. Um, for using what we what we just saw, but what would you use for for snow? Would would CTS do everything itself, or would you need to have something like what Bart made? Um, well, that's a really good question. I think we should explore that in CTS Lovely. when it's almost finished it's almost loading. Finished, isn't it? So it's so close, you can taste it. Is it's, the uh, API it's set up for packaged. MMOs? What's that? Is it set up for MMOs? Um, it's just uh, it's just another software subsystem. So if you had the the code that um, sent the information into the CTS, or oh, sorry, into WAPI, yeah, sure. But there's no specific support for MMOs. Uh, this is Kit saying this is kind of like Escape from Car uh, Tarkov does. They use weather current weather in Moscow to affect the weather in the game. Really. I didn't know they did. And Escape from Tarkov, as most people know, it's a Unity game as well. It's an example. Yeah, it looks amazing, doesn't yeah. it? it uh, argue, arguments people have is that you can't make a decent looking game in Unity. Because the argument previously was, okay, if you wanted to have like a, a decent multiplayer game, then all right, you know, Unity's going to help you with that. But if you want an FPS, then you'd go with um, Unreal. But then they say, if you want something that looks good, you would only use Unreal or CryEngine because you can't make anything that looks nice in Unity. And um, Escape from Tarkov. I mean, you can also say that Rust and um, The Forest already made that a stupid thing to say. But Escape from Tarkov just shows you how beautiful Unity can be. Yeah, I think, you know, the people that tend to say, oh, it's Unreal, I, I think that reflects the ignorance, their ignorance. Um, Unity can be amazing if you take the time to learn how to use it. The thing that Unre one of the things I think that differentiates Unreal and Unreal has done this really well. Unreal has better artist-friendly tooling. Unity is working at getting there, um, and Unreal has better defaults. So Unity, you know, all the stuff you get with post-processing stack, Unity doesn't give that to you. You have to set it up, and. When you learn how to set it up, then it can be amazing. But um, it it doesn't hold your hand as much as Unreal does. Well, the, and I think that has really, you know, added to this this feeling that it can't be as pretty. It's the thing though, it, it's um it, it feels like the, the the business model of Unity is more a case of here is a very bare bones vanilla um, framework for you to be able to extend and tailor it to your own need whereas unreal is like well we use this to make our games here you go here's the default that, that would get you started making the same type of like looking game as everyone else is going to make in this kit yeah and that's probably why you don't have by default the post-processing um, stack included because then everyone would just have it on by default and then they wouldn't be off looking for third party or external tools or making their own ones absolutely I, you know, and that's great because that gives um, opportunity to myself and other asset publishers to plug holes in that um, in in their in their product line. Okay, so CTS is loaded. Let's add CTS to this terrain. Okay, buddy. What should we do? So we'll go um, component. No, we'll go. I think it's component to the component menu. And CTS, and then go set linear deferred because we want the lighting to be right. So these are just some of the little things that CTS does for you to just make things a bit nicer and easier. Wolf you can do this by sorry, stepping right. through the... Sorry, go on, mate. No, I was just, just going to say that Warspawn's just saying that um, the weather in his local area is always hot and sunny. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the best to be able to, as a, as a use case scenario... Yeah, I think it's very much dependent on your game. 
having the option to do it is cool, but whether somebody actually wants to do it, that's a whole other thing. What's going on with your light? Just uh, press play and then stop again, I suspect. it's. What Unity version are you using? 2017.1? Yep. Go back. Yep, yep, yep. Something's... I know there was a bug in light in one of the versions, and I'm wondering if you've got that version. Uh, I thought um, like the version that had the less bugs. Yes, well, the light is not certainly responding correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to CTS. Uh, so component again. And CTS, add CTS to terrain. There it is. So it's now set up the terrain with the CTS object. And we can see it um, down the bottom there. Now let's go into... Now, CTS comes with a whole lot of profiles. It's a real pity your light is completely screwed up. Um, so you click, click into, in the, in the project hierarchy, CTS comes set up with a whole bunch of stuff already set up for you. So under the profile library, there's a whole bunch of scriptable objects with nice profiles. So just drag that little duvalaka to the left so we can read them. <laughs> Sorry about the technical terminology. Uh, and let, let's just zoom in to the terrain a little bit more so we can see this pop in when we do it. So, um, yeah, just drive in there. Uh, and let's, what's going on with your light? Let's, in your directional light, let's click on it. Let's try and fix your light. Drag the strength to 1.4, the intensity. Go up. Up, up, up. Intensity, yep, yeah, 1.4. There you go, we've got a bit more light happening here now. Um, click on profile G4. There you go. And wait for the inspector. Oh, here we go. Then click apply profile. This is good to think, fix light, you need to turn off auto generate and rebuild the lighting ourselves. Oh, don't worry about that. That's only if we do a build. We're not going to do a build. It's just a warning that CTS gives you about DX9. Ooh. And boom, we have just transformed our environment. Now, if we zoom back out a bit. No, I want to go in. <laughs> um, so, there's no more time. With, uh, Distingo. Very, very minimal. And somebody asked about snow. So, let's turn on some snow. Oh, snow. There you go. So, snow click snow. on the snow settings and scroll down and drag the snow amount from zero up. It's the first thing. Yep. What should, we, what should we stick it to? Oh! Go, and we got snow. So this is, you know, what CTS does is it makes everything literally, because that's all done in a scriptable object, you can actually run the game and tweak your settings for your terrain to be exactly how you want it to look in the game. And just reminding you about how about, beautiful scriptable objects are. Yeah, like this is not the same ugly terrain we saw a second ago, is it? And this is why I can't stand using standard Unity terrain anymore because when you get, you know, something like CTS in there, it all of a sudden it transforms. So um, I was so just, just going to ask you so a question. Um, Gaia, um, Distingo worked, works with Gaia, and that stops all of the um, that tiling look that you've got um, in a normal terrain. So with CTS, you don't need any other third-party tools that handles everything else itself. So it's got like uh, a, a, what, a purling noise on there just to break it up a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's using noise. It's using all, it's mixing a bunch of different things in there to, to change the way the thing looks. Um, you know, you've got your procedural snow there. You can swap that snow out and use a water texture and have it only glow, you know, down on the ground. And there's, there's lots and lots of things. Let's, um, let's just just to show you the power of this profile system. Let's zoom out so we can see the entire environment. There you go. And now click on another profile. Let's go to, say, G7 Test Geo. And wait for it to update. It'll take a second. And then go Apply. So just got a question so, asking, um, can you make snow creep during runtime? Uh, with World Manager API, what we do, snow has a minimum height. So, and a strength. So, with the World Manager API, absolutely you can. And that's all controllable from timeline as well. So, let's zoom into this and have a look at those rock formations. This light is really not doing it any favors, but. Um, so, this is our tessellation shader. 
and so you can see a bit of geo, sort of the height map geo stuff, and then you've got a height blending and an actual tessellation happening on this. So you can get really, really interesting and varied environments. And this is all from the same underlying paint there. So see that little rocky outclop in the center there down in the bottom? Let's zoom in on that. Yep. And just, uh, yeah, stop there. Maybe come down a bit closer to the ground because I want to be able to demo the tessellation for you. So, yeah, that'll do. Uh, maybe go up a little bit. And then let's go into our profile here. And so I've already selected it. And let's open up our Rock 1 texture. Yep, open that up. And scroll down. And somewhere here, let's have a look. Change the, try changing the height map contrast. Ooh. See how it's it's changing the way that that uh, height is being blended in. Just put it back to about where it was, oh. and oh no, back to the right, about there. Then change the height map depth. So again, we're exploring with how CTS is 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 interpreting that, and they are changed the so uh, leave it about there a bit more. Okay, now change the height map tessellation depth. It's the next one. And so they, they were actually modifying the tessellation. <clears throat> and working with Bart, who's, you know, been doing this a lot more than me, is that um, this, you treat tessellation, tessellation is an expensive um, process. It's, a, it's um, an interesting thing, but expensive from a um, rendering perspective. So you use it a little bit like you use normal maps. You use it just to add a little bit of variation and a bit of, interest but you you um you don't use it excessively because you know not we don't they, like it. yeah like that so even though we've drawn the mesh in a different way a nav mesh for example doesn't know that that exists and physics doesn't know that it exists because we've changed the way the normal unity environment does it so let's uh, and you can also see how um you can say let's change its smoothness so this is an example of the power, I suppose, of, of CTS. You can basically visually play with every setting on every texture, as well as you've got these global settings as well. And, you know, we've just improved the quality of the render massively. So rather, we won't go into all the details. Um, let's go back to, to Profile 4, because I just sort of like it. And it's actually one of our basic profiles, so it's... Of all the, the shaders, it's doing the least amount of work, so it, it renders most optimally. So hit uh, apply profile to bring it back. So there's there's the quick version of this, um, but it still looks pretty good for, you know, I think the vast majority of cases. I, I also, the advanced shader is really nice because it does the height map blending. So if you want to do interesting things with paths like rocks, you know, stones popping out of the path and so on, you can do all that. But let's go back to Gaia. Oh, we haven't even got to Gina yet. <laughs> we haven't finished Guy yet. Um, so it's actually a really good question, coverage of Gina. So we'll do one more thing with Gaia. We will um, we'll fill in some villages. We'll put some villages into this scene. Okay, okay. So open up the Gaia tab in your hierarchy, um, in the spawners that we put in earlier. Oh, hang on. Yep. That's it. And then, so we've done the texture. Now let's do the game object spawner. And zoom out a bit so you can see this work, because it's rather cool. And actually, just, uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, before, oh, not the, I, I like the view you had before. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that'll do. Now, you can see this with CTS applied to it. Let's go back to, click on the terrain itself and we'll go to the CTS. Um, no, actually, sorry, click on the profile. And let's just change this, scroll up. So see where it says shader type? Select Unity. That was before. And this is after. Oh, okay. You have to wait for it to load now. Oh, oh, quick, quick. Just, just click. Just click. Just click. Just click. Just click. Just click. Uh, stick it on basic. 
basics. This one's been optimized for basic. So you can see how dramatically um, CTS is in, in changing what's happening to your environment. Um, all right, so let's go back to Gaia and click on the game object spawner. And we'll just add some villagers. Just hit spawn. So just um, quickly, this is again from the resource script or object that we played about with earlier. Um, so we've got here, what I've seen here to, to randomize the mix up a little bit and then shape. This is my spawner, it's a box. Um, what's the max jitter percent? So when, so what this is doing, this is a, um, it's going to locate, it's going to step over the t every location on the terrain at an increment of 45 meters. And the jitter percentage is between this 45 meters and the next 45 meters, how accurate is it going to be? Is it going to be, you know, every 45 meters or is it going to be somewhere between here and 45 meters? So the more jitter is the more noise and randomness in the way it steps across the terrain. There's a huge amount of, if, if the, you know, there's 190 pages of, of documentation, I think, with Gaia. All of these, um, I, I, I just use the default stuff all the time, but if you want to go in, there's a huge amount of control you can have over how it does stuff. And so there's all sorts of different spawn algorithms and different ways of approaching it and ma masking and this and that and the other. But um, by default, I've, I've set up a bunch of nice stuff. And if you take my nice stuff, that's a good starting point from a lot of times. So we can spawn as, a sm instead of spawning on the small terrain, we can just do little biomes in certain parts of the terrain. We can blend between different biomes and all this sort of stuff if you take the time to work out what these settings do. Sweet. So let's click. So just hit spawn. Button. Let's just yeah, just put the magic button. Press button, make magic. Oh, did I push it? Did I push it? Uh, it? what it's doing is it's actually building a um what happened there? Did you cancel it? Just hit it again. It's it's caching a lot of information about the terrain so that it can run more quickly. So there you can see it popping in all of our interesting little points of interest. This is rocks and villages and farms and so on. You know how we, we created that little um, that ledge for our little village? It's some stuff there. So let's just zoom in um, and have a look at what it's done for us. And is it still yeah, no, just zoom into it? the scene. It's, it's And just select something else so that they're not all selected at the same time because it slows Unity down because it's, it's actually a lot of stuff it's just put in for you. Uh, just I open that up again and click in an individual rock pile. Double click. There you go. So it spawned those rocks. And then let's just have a wander around this scene. So it's put on these little rock piles, and if we go into the center, we'll see some villages. You can see the trees, and the, if you zoom in a bit closer. Oh, I don't like this. Where's my, where's my scrolly? There we go. That's better. Oh, and then just go on. We could put some more trees in there, couldn't we? Where's we could, but we'll actually we'll use Gina to do that. So it's put in these little villages. Of course, even put on. Um... Yeah, lots of little props and stuff. So these are 3D Forge um, village exteriors kit props. Uh, those rocks were Moda Proprio, that grass is Turbo Scalper, the textures are gametextures.com. If you zoom out just above this little village a bit, what what um, so, Gaia has done is it. Wait, just brief. This. All this stuff here, was this put like as, as a prefab beforehand with this is how you want everything to be laid out or was all these fences and stuff spawned in? All of this was spawned in as individual components. This is what I call point of interest or structure spawning. So that originally was laid out on a flat plane and then we dragged all of those objects together to create a new spawner from it or a new resource. <clears throat> and now Gaia and Gina as well can actually 
individually placed seeds in the scene. And what's sort of interesting is if you go down to ground level, um, so you can see that there's actually some variation in the height here. Oh, this is not such a great example, but um, you know the 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 fences are exactly conformed to the environment, so that the fences follow the the slope of the terrain, as do the little sheds. Whereas the houses poke straight up because we always build our houses up instead of on a slope. There you go. You so uh, that. yeah, like that's yeah. now an angle, whereas this is flush. Yeah. And these are all the little nuances and the little details that make the difference. If you were to do this manually, and we put a whole lot of this stuff in your scene for you, each one of these would take you a bunch of time. And then, you know, building those nice fences, what a pain that would be. So Gaia has taken all those sort of pre-configured setups and applied them automatically into your scene. And Origami, which is the new system that I'm building, will be able to actually, every single farm will be unique. So it'll actually, it takes, it creates a bunch, guides a bunch of rules about how to create the environment. Origami is how to create the points of interest. When do we get an origami? Um, hopefully in the next month. And I've, you know, I've looked in this space. Origami is something that is incredibly easy to use too. Once you, once you figure out the approach I've taken, you've gone, holy shit, why didn't somebody think of this earlier? Some of the other things guys done here is it's put grass here. Um, around it and it's retextured underneath the farm. Now I built this for the standard textures that come with Guy, not the ones we've swapped them with with Gina, so there's a bit of a mismatch, or sorry, with CTS. But anyway, you get the sense. So this is now um, a bit like with Vegetation Studio that's come out now, that this has now put this here, this, this these buildings and these fences, and now my ground texture obviously feels different because there's somebody living here. So they, that's right. They've planted. They've got their grass. They're they're looking after their home. Yeah. And, and you can actually create masks that exactly match the thing you're putting there, so that you can get an exact. You know, if you've got a driveway weaving out around your house or whatever, then that'll all exactly be applied to the terrain where your village is at the rotation and size that your village is, for example. They got a tree in there, God. Yep. All right, so let's let's add some trees in here. Now we'll demonstrate Gina. Normally I would do all the grass. Actually, we're going to add the grass first. So let's go. I uh, will do the jet trees after we've done the grass because I just want to do the the last part of of the Gaia demo. So click on the coverage detail. I should call it coverage grass, but Unity calls it details. That's it, and just hit spawn. So what's the so benefit we've got, of using Gaia over Gina for spawning grass? Um, so Gaia, Gaia is just going to cover the entire environment. Gina gives us a huge amount of control, but because obviously we've been talking for some time and I have some other things I have to do today as well, <laughs> uh, and I don't want to bore the crowd, um, so I'll give you a demo of how to use Gina to put in, say, some rocks and some trees for this and show you the difference between the two systems. So what Guy is doing is it's applying all of this to the entire terrain, but it's 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 set according to these predefined rules. And you know, when we go to put our trees in, we may not want all of them to be to across this generic predefined rules. So, you know, I always think I think I said before, the most interesting environments are the ones that are varied. So if you've used the same set of rules across the entire environment, well, it looks like the same set of rules, to my eye anyway, is that it's the same set of rules. Whereas Gina is going to allow us to put in that specific stuff in a specific location. Does that run already? That was pretty quick on your machine. That's finished spawning. Looks it's like it. Beast, mate. All right. So, you know, there we spawn in a bunch of grass and stuff into your scene and there's little flowers and all sorts of cute little things in there and it's a standard old unity grass one of the things i've been experimenting with is high poly you know high density grass which with vegetation studio is incredible and i don't even do build builder grass anymore when i'm creating rich environments but um you need something like vegetation studio and instancing to be able to do that i was going to say that but i mean all of his videos that he's doing now showing off his beautiful new assets 
um, is like it's a standard workflow. You've got Gaia Gina, CTS, Vegetation Studio, and then Bart's Grass and Trees and Textures. Yeah, uh, couple of that with um, micro scans, uh, mega scans, and um, your new plugin that you you spoke about earlier to be able to import directly from those guys into Unity. That that just it sounds exciting. Yeah, well, I'm excited by it um, just because of what I can create with it. I really enjoy creating these beautiful, rich environments. All when right, so let's, a, let's when, try it. Wait, wait, wait. When are you going to give us a video of origami? Um, I, I'm still, I've been working on it at a thousand miles an hour, and it's almost ready to start showing off. Um, not quite yet, though. Give me another couple of days. By the end of this weekend, it'll be ready to show. All right, so let's go. Right click in your hierarchy. Now, we can do it that way, or we'll do it this way. Just right click in your hierarchy, go up. Yep. Yep. Gina. Add spawner. Oh, I stuck it in there. Oops, don't want to parent it to that. You just just pop it out. Alright, let's stick it down here. Hang on. Beaut. Now, Gina is a generic spawning system. Whoops. Um, just zoom into your terrain. So first of all, we need something for Gina to spawn. So, Gina already understands your terrain. So click on Add Tree. She really understands my terrain. It's smart enough it knows that you've got a terrain there and it's worked out what's in it. Mm -hmm. So if you open up the spawn prototypes um, little box there. Yep. So that is the tree that Gina picked up out of your terrain and it's a broadleaf desktop. If you just pull that drop down down. Uh, yep. Nobody yep. can see, but there's, 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 the other, there's, conifer. there's the other one you've got in your terrain. But we'll stick with broadleaf because it looks better. So, Gina can spawn either things that are already in your terrain or new prefabs. So, in, in this example, we're going to spawn something that's already in our terrain. So, hit shift click somewhere on your terrain. Uh, let's zoom in because you can't really see it. So, Gina, see, notice how it's, it's actually drawing this little visualization thing on the terrain. So this is what Gina says you can spawn in. And in the same way that Gaia gives you a little bit of control over, well, a whole bunch of control over where you can spawn, Gina is actually sampling where you've clicked and worked out, hey, based on height and slope and textures and everything else, I can spawn here. So let's just, uh, instead of shift clicking, now control click. So just, just looking at chat, Warspawn saying, uh, Gina, you should demo spawning stuff inside a house instead of on a terrain. Wow, I didn't even think about uh, that. Well, well, we'll do that in a second. We'll, we'll do it on the house instead. I don't have interior houses here, so. But you know, the fact that we can do it on also means we can do it in. Um, so so said, just, yep. so just uh, instead of shift clicking, go control click. Cool, we've added a tree. Notice that the visualization that Gina has there has automatically excluded that tree. So it won't ever try and put another tree inside the same spot. So it's got things like automated um, obstacle detection. Um, so let's scroll back up to our settings and I'll just briefly talk about what they are inside the Gina. In the... So I just enjoy myself. <laughs> this, is, this is incredibly cool once you get used to it. So the overview is this, this is a broadleaf desktop spawner. It'll always spawn one instance, but let's change its minimum instances or max instances to say 15 or 20, doesn't matter, and min instances to say five. Now it'll try and spawn between five and 50, 20 instances. Now there's a thing called a throw distance. Throw distance is sort of like, um, you know, what happens with, um, what's the right word? Um, with a seed, you know, when a when a, a, a tree breeds, its its seed gets thrown a certain distance. So that's how far away, up to how far from where you click, that Gina will try and place something. And then there's the range. See that? So just drag that slider on the spawn range, and watch what happens to your visualization. So this is the area that Gina will try and spawn within. 
So let's make a reason. So let's say 100 meters. That's cool. And then the throw distance. Let's change that down to say 25. And then um, let's go away from this area. Go up on the hill a bit more. Just find another area. Yeah, over here looks good. Zoom in. Now shift click. Uh, you've got to you got to select Gina when you do that. Yeah, and then shift click. So what's happening here is it's it's showing you a visualization of what Gina considers suitable to spawn. And just so just uh, just don't move for a second. Now let's go to our spawn criteria. It's uh, down down in the next two tabs down. Just zoom in out a little bit. Yeah. So scroll up. There you go. Open that up. Now. This is what it's using. It's checking height, it's checking slope, it's not doing anything with textures, and it's not using a mask, and it's using bounds-based collisions. And bounds-based collisions means it's looking for, it'll try not to spawn anything inside the volume or the space of something else. So let's change the slope range. Let's change, just uh, increase the slope range and watch what happens to the visualization. So as we make it more tolerant, to slopes around your where you clicked, it will be, yeah, you know, it'll it'll choose more of those locations. So it's basically this is within 40 degrees or 30 38 degrees of where you are right now. If you shift click somewhere else, because we're going to sample a new place in the terrain, you can see it's see it's split the mountain because that's quite steep, but at all the area around it's looking pretty good. So now control click just there. Cool. So we've now placed a nice, interesting little copse of trees, and it's used all those rules to determine exactly where those trees should go yep. within the constraints of that um, spawn criteria. So if I just ended up. Where was it? Yeah, over to your right. That's it. Lost me tree. Anyway. There it is. Beaut. Cool. So. You know, it's a fairly dense little copse of trees, but then we can start to do all sorts of other things like pearl and noise based masking and, and all sorts of really, really powerful things. But this is the difference between G Gina and Gaia. This gives you precise control over where you put things. Whereas Gaia goes, hey, I'm gonna apply these sets of rules to everywhere. The other thing that Gina does is it, it you know, that real time visualization of, of what, what it's doing and where it's doing it, and then it's got masking and all sorts of other things. There's a video, uh, go and have a look at the, the main video on the Gina product, and it shows you a whole bunch of the different features. So let's do um, two things. Let's, let's make two different trees, and we'll put them one at one level of height in the terrain, and another, like we'll create two distinct areas of trees. So um, let's, Let's uh, this is a fairly, let's let's put um, pines on slopes. So we'll create another. So just click um, and create another Gina spawner. So just unselect it. That's it. Yep. And then go add tree on the prototypes. Well, I've got a little thing here. Gina spawners. I can stick Marva spawners. Yeah, yeah. By default, if you don't already parent it, it'll it'll do it for that's you. Nice. So click on another one and click on add tree. So it picks up a tr tree out of the terrain and open up the spawn prototypes. And instead of the broadleaf, we'll use the conifer. So it'll now spawn the conifer for us and scroll up. I think it's still called broadleaf. We, we need to rename the actual spawner. I don't do, do that by default because you could actually be spawning lots of different things. And I just scroll up in the name, it'll automatically pick it up. Oh. There you go, just in the name bit. Yeah, call it conifer. And let's set the max instances to say 30. Uh, yeah, that'll do. Lots and lots. And then the minimum instances to say 5. And the spawn range to say 200. And these throw distance make that about 20. 
It won't be too dense, or that'd be quite dense. Make it 30. All right, so, um, so again, you can see how it's in interpreting the terrain. You can see where it won't spawn because it's showing you that because, you know, the, there's no green dots there. So let's click on the side of a bit of a hill because I want the, them, the, these to be on the hills. You'll, you'll see when you get it right because it'll, it'll light up properly. There you go. So we're going to grow these just there. So just um, hit, con hit uh, control click and we'll just test it. Got one. Try it again. Yeah. There you go. There's a little group of them. Let's change the throw distance to say 50. The reason it never got any further because it didn't throw a seed far enough. So this is choosing so what, what I do is I shift click and then without moving the mouse, if I'm happy with what gets selected, hit control shift click. It's actually, if you look, it's actually gone across the entire terrain and found every other spot like it on the terrain and put some trees there. And this is what you were saying about the other day, if you wanted to put meshes along your terrain yes. to say, okay, I want, yeah. I want this to be cliffs everywhere yeah. here. Yeah. So there. And so, and am I able now? Because I've just got one conifer here at the moment. And if I add more more trees here, then it's going to randomly um, mix them up between which one it's spawning. Yes, it does. In fact, you can even wait. So I, with um, some of the speed tree packs, they're Alaskan cedar. I make the main tree spawn eighty percent of the time, and I make the other, you know, the 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 old rotten dead one spawn five percent of the time and so you'll get mostly healthy trees but then you'll get these you know a small percentage of dead ones thrown in there as well yes fresh meat it is cool as sugar so let's create another spawner so I click out of that hierarchy and just right click oh we can do that too yep now this time instead of putting a tree we're going to put a prefab so let's go into our third party samplers and go into the rocks, which is Moda Proprio. And real rocks. So this is a small sample of his real rocks and click onto the lotted prefabs. And let's just drag uh, rock one. You need to scroll up because the little drag thingy is missing. Yep, it's, it's just covered up. Scroll down, sorry. Yep, that's it. Drag and drop that lod onto there. Boom. You notice we've now got a new spawn prototype. And let's open that up. So, and then open up the details. So this is a rock. It will conform to the terrain. There's a whole bunch of information about that rock in terms of how it gets spawned into the environment. Gina has the ability to do things like automatic um, light probe generation, automatic optimization of your rocks so that you know they're spawned properly. So you've got complete control over that stuff. Even will tell you how big the rock is, like the base size and scale there. So Gina knows a lot about, has got a lot of metadata about this, which if you want to have, um, uh, you know, go into a lot more detail, you can. I did have an undo in Gina, um, but Unity kept crashing because I'd spawn, you know, a million things into the scene and Unity wasn't able to handle it. It's got an undo system. I called the undo system and it would crash. So Unity, um, sorry, Gina has an undo to a degree. It can delete all um, things of a specific type, but it doesn't have a last event type undo. In this case, we're actually going to draw, um, we're going to spawn in game objects. And you can actually tell Gina to parent them all to one common parent, or you can tell Gina to spawn every single one as a new parent. So you'll have a parent object like spawn, blah, 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 and then everything that goes in in that spawn. So you can get your undo that way. Um, there are different ways, there's always a different way to do this. So let, we've got our rock here. Let's go and uh, just click somewhere and put one in. Okay, so got my rock. So Fresh Meat's just yes. asking, can you change the values and update later I you change the size of the rocks? Um, no. Once they're, they're spawned, they're spawned. That's right. So yeah, just zoom in there. 
and just hit control click and there we have a rock <laughs> so let's zoom in a bit more and have a bit of a closer look at that rock you notice actually in your hierarchy it's now created a um, I've got some, uh... yeah, it looks like LOD bias just double click on the rock actually that could help you get rid of it so there's the rock and it's embedded it into the terrain yeah. and um, let's yeah we can do all sorts of things we can get them to conform to the terrain we can create little piles um, we can you know change the size we can change the rotation there's lots and lots of things you can do with this let's go over to our um, uh, our building let's just find a building and we'll spawn a rock onto a building Yeah, in a specific instance. Otherwise, you'll zoom out like that. <laughs> Just double click on a specific instance. There you go. All right. So let's go and put a rock on the side of the roof of that building. Ah, we're going to have a problem because Cobus has used box colliders. So let's try, let's look at the, um, yeah, that instead. That's a bit closer. So select your genus spawner. Again, it's it's based on the type, the quality of the colliders. These are all box colliders, but you can go and uh, con con control click on top of that, and it'll place the rock there. And there it is. <laughs> um, actually, no. What else is happening here? Sorry, I've given you a bum steer. This entire thing has a collider around it. The way in which Gaia works is it adds colliders to stop things from um, spawning through things. So let's delete that rock. Yeah, so just delete it. And let's go to um, scroll up a bit. Actually, no, go into your hierarchy on the left and just close all that stuff down so we can see it. In fact, just select it. Select, um, don't worry about it. Click on um, the coverage game object spawner. And I just want to show you something. Notice how there's a collider around the whole thing. This is how I stop trees from getting spawned through objects. Now these are all set up so they disappear at runtime, but they're still here in our scene because we're still spawning. So underneath that spawn game object, that game object spawner, there's so left in your hierarchy. One second, buddy. Um, Aquarius Max are just said that he's watching through xbox and he's got a better connection than his computer and uh, if anyone can actually send a message over to uh robson and let him know because he wasn't able to use twitch on his computer so maybe he could use an xbox or something like that oh cool uh Wilson saying stream your asset making from xbox yes indeed sorry buddy you wanted me to go where on the left hand side so so i, I want to be able to Spawn that rock on that building so we need to turn off all these extra colliders mm -hmm. so if you look under the game object the coverage game object spawner there you've got spawn game objects so that's yeah you're in the right place go back to the left no no go to the left yeah so that's all the game objects themselves and then you've got a what, collider cache yeah oh yeah that's it just disable that that'll turn them all off guy does this at runtime automatically so oh, now so we've got rid of those colliders little, it's not actually a child of these it sits by itself to make it easier to you just yeah oh, that's awesome yeah it's just a little trick because unity doesn't give me much information so now when you click on the top of that uh, little thing there you should be able to get a rock a, approximately the right spot and there we have it yay so what's really you know putting rocks on the top of a building is not such a cool thing. And it's going through the building because of the way I've set up the prefab. You, you know, you can actually make it sit there exactly. Yeah, but, it's nice um, how you've got your, because your rock doesn't sit on the ground, it you know, sinks into the ground, so. Yeah, and the reason I sink them in is because um, they're designed to be on terrain and terrain's not flat. So you don't want these ugly missing gaps. Floating so, rocks. So let's say we wanted to put uh, on the, the roof of that building, we wanted to put some nice ferns and some moss and all that sort of stuff. You know, if you've got, if you've got a mesh collider on the, on the 3D model in particular, Gina allows you to have really, really precise control 
over where it puts things on the model and on the mesh. So Gina can do terrain, but it also can do 3D models, which is very powerful. It's a great way of... So with some of the nature manufacturer and his um, demo scenes for his um, um, graveyard kit, you'll see ferns and candles and all sorts of little interesting things. He's actually used Gina to place them into the scene for him because it'll automatically conform to the normal and it'll automatically embed them so they look like they're just organically there. If you want to get really high uh, quality vegetation into Unity, instead of using billboard grass, which is what you get with Gaia, you really want to be doing 3D models and meshes and all that sort of stuff. And the problem with Unity is that it uh, it just struggles with that level of fidelity, right? You you When you start to really push things at it, the default stuff doesn't work very well. So um, if you've seen uh, Vegetation Studio, around that's um, what that tool is doing is it's instancing the vegetation and being it's basically taking over the way unity does it and it's only with vegetation studio that you can start to get um, the level of information being managed by unity and still delivering decent frame rates so let's let's very finish quickly finish off this environment and we'll just do the last part of the guide uh, demo and um, so we've we I showed how you could use Gina to very do very customized spawning but we'll fit we'll use Gaia to finish this off just because of time um, so let's get back to our spawners oh first of all turn on our bounds colliders again because mm -hmm. we need them so that Gaia doesn't put things through things Yep. and go to back to our spawners. So let's click on our tree coverage, uh, click on our clustered tree spawner. Uh, which one did we So do? we're just going out back to Gaia to just finish oh, off okay. and show you the last part of what Gaia can do for you. So just zoom out so we can see this. So you've so, clustered tree and coverage tree then? Yeah, that's right. So clusters creates natural clusters, like, you know, little groups of trees in a forest, that sort of thing. So just uh, go into your spawner and click spawn. Yep. And so now we're creating, and now, now click spawn again. Spawn doesn't need to be done once. You can actually do it as many times as you like. You just keep spawning until you get enough density in your environment. And one more. And you'll notice it's still some gaps in amongst the trees. So click on your coverage tree spawner. Yep, just run that a couple of times. It'll just fill in the holes. Cool, so we've got our environment. We've used CTS, we've used um, Gina to customize it. And it's quite a rich and interesting two kilometer by two kilometer environment. Let's uh, go back to Guy Manager, and we're going up to step three now. Go back to Standard. Click on Add Player, Wind, Water, and Screenshotter. And you're working with, um, you do a lot of integration with Aquas, don't you? Yep. It's one of the questions we get, I think every day we get the question asked, which water, Unity water package would you suggest? Yep. Um, so Aquas is good, Simono is good, um, there's a few others. The Ultimate Water System, I bought Playway and then I was disappointed that I had to pay a lot of money to get Ultimate Water System as well. And then I haven't found it to be particularly fantastic out of the box either. So, you know, Simono and Aquas are pretty pretty good. Which is the one so, that, um, that was doing those, uh, all the waves and some military... Um, some countries, um, I don't know if it was like Navy or something, was using it for submarine simulations. Yeah, uh, look, there's a few other ones. CETO was pretty cool until the author decided not to do it anymore. And I don't know, I've had most of the water solutions at some point because it's sort of my interest. So what Guy's just done for us is it's now added um, the first person player into our scene and it's added some water into our scene. Because Gaia understands where water belongs and so on, it's basically automated a bunch of all just the other tedious little things that you have to do to finish your scene off. So we've now actually got a runnable scene. So let's run it. 
Um, did you want me to, has it already put on the post-processing on the camera? Or? No. In order for that to, you actually actually have to install post-processing. Yes. We've and we don't want to see that because it makes such a dramatic difference. We, yeah, we've got that in our, in our scene at the moment, so it's, it's chucked in. Is it? Yep. Have you installed this? And I didn't see it. Did you actually install? Okay, fantastic. Good. Great. All right. Oh, don't turn that off. Get rid of it. God does this for you. Oh, oh, oh. Let's do it. All right. Let's do so, it. Now, I'm, we're going to do something a little bit tricky. Just pop out that guy manager window um, so it's floating. Yeah, they won't be able to see that. So let me... Let me um, ah. Oh, well, we'll just have to tell I, people that can it's... I, can I stick it over here? No, I don't want you to... Um, I want you to not be childed because we want to see most of the scene. So I just okay. want to... That's it. And just make it a bit smaller. Hang on, my computers. Come on, what are you doing? Oh, you've got a nice black screen in the um, stream again, too. Can nobody, this, see, uh, can nobody see it? Is the window being shared? Hang on a sec. And somebody commented about the colliders. Those colliders are switched off at runtime, and you can delete them out of your scene. It's purely for spawning, and it's to make up for the fact that Unity doesn't give me any information about trees. And when you're procedurally jetting these environments, you've got to obviously cater to trees as well. So can you, Actually, can you guys, in, sorry, but just to see if you can chat while you're saying, can, can they confirm that they can see the floating window? Everyone's quiet in chat. Everyone's gone home. They have. And I've said that they've had enough of this. They're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, they can see. Okay, sorry, buddy. Great. All right, so just play this scene. Actually, no, before you do this, let's go to our first-person player. There's a, something that Unity does with it, which really annoys me. Um, oh, hang on, you, you were going to put the post-processing on there. No, no, we'll do that at runtime. Oh, I just want to show no visually what, what a difference it makes. Okay. No worries, my pleasure. No, no, we're just is starting it, now. Is it over? <laughs> Almost over. <laughs> we did a lot of talking, a lot of um, around the, the, the side sort of things. So just get a bit of a more of an interesting view here. And just look back out over, you know, back down towards, there we go. So let's, let's change our lighting. Let's take this to the next level. So click onto Gaia Manager which you won't be able to do because Unity's grabbed you. Oh, you can. Fantastic. That's it. Uh, on GX. And, yeah, camera and light. And go create camera effects. Boom. So it's just add post-processing for us. And now go set morning light. Give it a second. Gotta grab my baby girl. Uh, do, 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 do. Gonna get some... There we go. There we go. So now let's have a wander around in our scene and see how this has transformed the way it looks. Oh. So we've added a little bit of fog. We've added some post processing, and you know, set some morning sorts of looks to it. Now this is not as cool as um, you know, customized, specialized lighting systems, but. Um, this is just a very, very, if you're new to this stuff, um, this is hard to do. Like there's a lot of learning that needs to happen to go behind this. I would never ever use Unity Water in a scene, by the way, its performance is terrible. Um, but, you know, I can't give away somebody else's assets, so that's, I've just set it up. But yeah, we've just created this really cool environment. If we'd actually not been talking, this would have taken 10 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, it's got villages, like if you go for a wander around, and um, so just find to point out, these spikies that we've got every now and again, we can just run the guy a smooth and it'll just yeah, make, absolutely. make a run over the entire terrain, just moving out any spikies that we might get. Yeah, skyrockets in flight. That's right, Gaia morning light. <laughs> Good for prototyping, it's perfect for prototyping, and that's why there's a um, there's a, a Unity video. Oh, we found a house. 
it's actually when you get an interesting environment, it's really fun just to go and walk around in it and discover all the stuff <laughs> that guys put in for you. Because you, you didn't make it, you don't you don't know what's going what's 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 to happen. What you gonna That's right. Do? This is this is all pseudo procedural. Mm. My collider is stopping me from doing anything fun. What's over here? He has to run to check. There's a lot. There's a lot of colliders. No, they've all been switched off. The only colliders uh, now are the box colliders that were on the original models. So if you don't want them in your models, just don't put them in your models and you won't have them. <laughs> then change the scale. <laughs> this leads to a good conversation that we had last week with Aquarius Max in that whenever he's making anything, he puts in the full FPS controller from Unity to see, okay, how does the FPS controller look? Okay, it fits nicely. And then he sticks in um, the, the Ethan model as a gauge yeah. of what the third person controller height should be and everything and then everything just is weird it's off and yeah. if, you, if you put yeah. Uma next to Ethan it turns out that Ethan is actually a, a small child and Uma is like his dad so if you look at Uma Uma's at the height that the first person controller is and everything feels around, around about right but Ethan that you get for free and that scale that you get for free with Unity it's completely different it's like they, they couldn't make up their mind. Yeah, absolutely. It, it always it's always dependent on your game and the assets you're using. Hey, let's change to evening light. Can, can we can we change to afternoon light just so people can see? Yeah. Oh yeah. Do 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 do. Give it a second. Sky Mood music. It's in flight. Boom. Afternoon delight. Yeah, so we have afternoon. <sighs> So there we go. We've covered actually a lot of ground in a fairly short amount of time. So optimization is a whole nother, somebody asked a great question about optimization. Um, there's a lot you can do to optimize this environment. Um, Gaia, it's got a configuration that's set up sort of okay for a mid-level desktop, but you can change how you set things up so that it's it's more optimal, um, and it really depends on your game. To get much better uh, water performance, I'd use Aquas, for example, that's relatively lightweight. I would, for the trees and vegetation and plants, I'd use Vegetation Studio. You know, I run big environments on my desktop on a GDX 1070, which admittedly is a nice card, but it's also, um, you know, my actual desktop's about three years old, and I, you know, I have generally no problems getting up at a, around 100, 120 frames a second on some fairly rich environments. But it all always depends. Uh, if you go to my, yes, uh, Gaia and Gina do have the ability to scale things any way you like. Um, these are just the default ones that I put together. Um, there's actually, if you go to the blog section on my website, there's a um, whole section on optimization. And what I've done is um, just picked and chosen based on my own experience and other people's experience, good settings, and talked about it. Um, Gaia just does standard Unity. If you want to plug in other shaders, there's nothing to stop you. You just need to, instead of spawning... Um, Meshes as drying grass, you might want to spawn prefabs. Again, I would suggest something like um, Vegetation Studio, which will instance it. Um, and, um, you know, set your shader up and your materials up to use that, and you'll get huge performance out of it. Okay, so that environment there is a real world environment. It's actually a place in America. And, um, it's still, um, this particular scene, it's still early stages of development. But I'm using Enviro for the, um, the clouds and the general lighting. And 
um, some of nature manufacturer's beautiful uh, tree pack and then his rock pack and some of his foliage and then the um, some of the um, there's a product that's not released yet called aura but I've been um, you know doing some exploratory work with the author of aura and aura is this really incredible volumetric lighting asset so the underlying terrain here was created with Gaia um, but you know and the texturing is done by CTS but then the rest is a blend of other tools can you say where you this got thing, your, your um, real world high map from so yeah what was that the the because you said this is from a real world height map is that from terrain party or from something else yeah no I got this from terrain party I actually found the area that I was interested in using Google Maps well, actually, no, I found it using Terrain Party because I love the relief view. And then um, I replicate, I found it in Google Maps. And then, you know, the rest is, there's a little bit of creative um, stuff. Now, somebody asked, what's the maximum size of a terrain? Um, Gaia 2 already does, when it, when it releases, it will have linked terrains. It's already actually working, though. And so Gaia 1 doesn't link terrains at the moment. You have to do it manually, which is, you know, pretty average um, it's it's not a great experience and the maximum size of a terrain is uh, people have made them up to 32 kilometers but if you're going to run a really big terrain like that in unity it's going to look average and it's going to run very poorly yeah. so the reason I mostly use two kilometer by two kilometer trains which is what the size of the environment is that we were just looking at is because it's actually a size that runs well and works fairly well in unity and um, I was gonna. I'd just like to share with everyone an old workflow that I used to have. That I one ex once explained it to Adam, and and uh, I think you like you called me nuts, or you were like that's that sounds like a nightmare. So what I did was um, I used something like um, I think it was Terrain Party. I think I can't remember what I used at the time. It was before I knew about Terrain Party, but I went and got a real world height map of the area that I wanted. And I went into Mudbox and I made myself um, some custom like drawn mountains that I, that I wanted to, to just do detail myself um, and then made that into a, a height map and then went into World Machine and made my massive world of what I wanted in World Machine. And then I chopped um, had World Machine slice everything because it can say, okay, what size do I want to have this huge world sliced up? And I sat there, left it, I think it was like an entire day working around, um, chopping up, sliced up into all the little pieces. Lovely. So it was like, um, like uh, Adam was saying, like a 2K by 2K. Um, so if you had like a 48K world and, it, and World Machine went and sliced everything perfect and then went inside um, Unity and made a series of terrains in unity and then made guy put guy stamps and clicked fit to terrain for each one so they were perfectly sized and then stamped and then you'd use something like world streamer to stitch everything together yeah you pretty much want to kill yourself when you do that <laughs> absolutely somebody asked if the guy uh, to upgrade will be free and the answer is yes and um, just Normally, like to, yeah. to raise a point on that one, because um, a long time ago, you did say about how you wanted to bring Multitold to Gaia. And yes. And it's, it's like, it wasn't even an official statement that you said, it was just something that you said. And because you had said that so long ago, even though with all these new features of Gaia 2, um, you know, you should be charging for it because you should be making money on it. Um, you said that you wanted to bring that functionality to Gaia. Um, you couldn't bring it to Gaia, so now it's coming to Gaia too. But as such, you gave your word, and that's why you're giving it for, to, for free, which is, um, you know, it's outstanding and something that, you know, everyone in this chat as customers on the Asset Store appreciates. And that's why we support um, the developers and we get, you know, an attachment to, to developers because they show not only that they make great assets, but they want to support their customers and they value their customers. Um, and their community that they build. So as I have a voice and everyone else can just t a chat, I will say 
um, thank you very much, and yes, very commendable, and appreciate it, uh, very appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I, you know, I, I thought I'd actually have multi tile and Gaia a lot long, you know, a lot, f a long time ago, and you know, then life happens, and you know, I still need to pay the bills and all this other fun stuff. So um, it's taken longer, and I, I just thought, well, you know, you bought it with the understanding you'd get it. So, you know, I've got to honor that. Um, there is the dog studio. Guy is already incredible, a huge upgrade for a free, uh, is an amazing deal, already a still and at its current price. It is, and Gina too. Um, Liquid Silk Studios, apologies if I missed. Do we have approximate release date on Gaia 2? Thank you for your efforts and updates. <coughs> it's really appreciated. Uh, Liquid Silk, Gaia 2 was released already in this stream and everyone got a free copy. Dude, you missed it. Oh, I was <laughs> badly kidding. I couldn't do that to you. Damn it. <laughs> um, I appreciate anyone putting in their word before money. Exactly. It makes me want to buy more of your future products. Indeed. Yeah, look, all I can say is there's a, a, a lot of good stuff coming this year. Um, I feel like everything leading up to this year was just getting warmed up and um, very, very excited for what the, the year will bring. There's some stuff that I haven't announced which um, will be, you know, it hasn't been seen on the planet, let alone in Unity. So, um, <clears throat> well, now looking gonna, forward to, to bringing some cool stuff You've got to give us more details. Come on, you can't just say you can't say no one on the planet has seen this little on Unity and not give us a little bit like when we can expect something so sexy. Look, I announced Origami. That's that's good enough for <laughs> for one, uh, and also the other product, the um, the automatic importing system from for Mega Scans and other assets. It's just a generic importing system. So that's two new announcements. That's not too bad. <laughs> All right, guys. I think we will have to say thank you to Adam for coming, taking your time away from his family. It's it's a, a Saturday where you are, isn't it, bud? Yep. It's it's nearly uh, lunchtime, and um, I'm just about to go and have a shower, and um, then go off and play baseball for the afternoon, and have a few beers with my mates. Kind of Australian, which is exactly aren't what we should you? be doing. <laughs> Where's the cricket? I went and saw um, American football over when I was working in the States, though. It was good fun to watch. Americans do sport really well. They make an event out of it, and I love it. Well, you make an event out of making assets on the asset store, buddy. So thank you for your um, brief one hour that turned into over three-hour chat. That is my absolute pleasure. I hope um, for those of you who are watching that you learned something. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you if you want to ask questions. And um, yeah, thanks, mate. Really appreciated having a, the chance to have a yak with you. It was good fun. And that's it for this four-part huge interview with Adam Goodrich. It wasn't just an interview, was it? It was a tutorial as well, where we learn how to make a procedure world with a Gaia Gina CTS. So guys, if you do like these videos, click on those big, juicy, red subscribe button down below. Tell all your friends, your neighbours, random people on the street. The Messy Coder is on Twitch, he's on YouTube, he's on Twitter, he's on Facebook. He's anywhere that you can find somebody spamming some content. And if you do like it, click it. Till next time. If you want to see more of my crazy videos, click on the left side of your screen now. And down below, there's that big, juicy subscribe button. And right next to it is the magic bell that if you click it, it will tell you if I've got a new video coming out. Till next time.